so we met the forensic psychologist picked by Amber Heard's team. And I would tell you that she had Dr. Hughes had a very different vibe than Dr. Curry, who was used by Johnny Depp's team. Uh, I already did a video on Dr. Curry. I thought she was objective, professional. I thought she made a lot of sense. I thought her argument made a lot of sense. Dr. Hughes, I felt the opposite. I think her outcome makes sense, but she didn't come across as professional. I thought she was super biased. I thought she seemed uh, pissed off and angry the entire time, super defensive, and I thought her logic was weak. So, so I have three global things I want to talk about. So first, let's start with the assessments. The assessments she used were, in my opinion, weak. Started off good. She had the personality assessment inventory. That's a reasonable measure of personality. It is similar to the MMPI that was used by Dr. Curry for Depp's team. Makes sense. Looking at personality, psychopathology, good tool. Then she uses the um, CAPS-5. This is a the clinician-administered measure of PTSD. Totally reasonable measure. It's the gold standard for measuring PTSD. Same test used by Johnny Depp's team. Now, the two psychologists arrived at different conclusions, but same assessment used. Notice that they, they arrived at different conclusions because that's the one test that is driven by the clinician's questions and interpretation of what Amber Heard says, right? So it's definitely the most influenced by personal bias on the part of whoever the clinician is. But those two tools are reasonable tools or, or approaches to use to evaluate somebody. And then Dr. Hughes uses what I think are weak tools that allow her to manipulate the data or the symptoms. So you have the Beck Depression Inventory, which just measures symptoms of depression. It is an incredibly face valid, meaning very easy to look at the questions and know exactly what they are measuring. So they're trying to measure depression. So the questions are things like, do you have difficulty sleeping? Do you have difficulty eating? Do you overeat? Whatever the symptoms are, very, very easy to understand exactly what the questions are about. So if you are malingering, it wouldn't be hard to do so. Then the next one is the Beck Anxiety Inventory. Just like the Beck Depression Inventory, very simple, about 20 questions, easy to administer and easy to game. So if you think about PTSD, the symptoms that you might experience are unquestionably anxiety and symptoms of depression. Those both are present in PTSD, especially when you measure them using the Beck Depression Inventory and the Beck Anxiety Inventory because those two tools are well known for having difficulty differentiating between the two. What that means is if you score high on the Beck Anxiety Inventory, you oftentimes also score high on the Beck Depression Inventory. So the psychologist could look at high scores on both of those and go, that must be due to PTSD. That's, I think, how she's interpreting it. And then she used the trauma symptoms inventory, also very face valid, very easy to gain, a measure of do you have trauma, what, what traumatic, just goes down the DSM list of PTSD symptoms, do you have these? Super easy to gain. And what's important about it, I think in this case, because the argument is made that Depp is responsible for Amber's PTSD, that questionnaire does not differentiate from specific events. It's not asking, do you have PTSD from X or Y? It's just saying, do you have this symptom, which is a symptom of PTSD? Then she uses the mood disorder questionnaire, which is designed to measure whether or not somebody is bipolar. This test is, again, exceptionally simple and exceptionally easy to game. So if Amber wanted to come up or to show herself as being bipolar, it would be very easy for her to do that. And if she wanted to look like she didn't have bipolar, also very easy to do that. And then she followed those assess all those super simple assessments up with more super simple assessments measuring intimate partner violence. She used three separate tools, all designed to measure whether or not someone had intimate partner violence, right? So this is just self-report of, did you experience this? Again, beyond easy to game. So if you look at the full battery, it looks like reasonable personality assessment, reasonable, reasonable measure of PTSD, easy to influence on the clinician's part, and then, in my opinion, uh, inappropriate for court assessments. Now, she did follow all that up with the MFAST, which is a separate measure designed to see if somebody is malingering or the extent to which someone is faking bad. The problem is that that's a good tool. The problem is that I think it's very easy for Amber or for potentially her psychologist to recognize and help Amber recognize that this is a separate tool. And on this tool, she should be honest. 
it, it's concerning to me that the scale of malingering wasn't part of the other assessments, right? It's too bad there wasn't a measure of malingering when Amber was responding to questions about PTSD or about depression or about anxiety. You, you know, look, if you look at the assessments used by Dr. Hughes on Amber's side and the assessments used by Dr. Curry, you can see that on both cases, the clinician has the ability to, to work with the data to get the conclusion they want. And it's no surprise that both arrived at the conclusions that fit exactly the case of their, their respective teams. Now, the second piece of Dr. Hughes' testimony that bothers me is not the PTSD diagnosis. I think it's actually totally reasonable to think that, that Amber has PTSD. What bothers me is that Dr. Hughes is so certain the PTSD is due to Johnny Depp's behavior and the behavior of Johnny Depp's lawyers. I don't know. I haven't been able to figure it out. Maybe I'm missing it online. I don't know what Amber Heard's childhood looked like. I do know, based on her testimony, that she wanted to get the hell out of Dodge as soon as she could. There were things going on in her background, in her past, that weren't real good. And it is very possible, in my opinion, that there was trauma caused by that as well. And so to be able to, as a psychologist, look at it and go, these symptoms of PTSD are only from this current event that we happen to be at trial about seems highly suspect to me, especially if you start saying that, that the lawyer disagreeing with her was traumatic. The poor woman is in the middle of a trial where the world is saying to her that what happened didn't happen. She would be incredibly distressed. If that were the case, she would be overwhelmed by distress, by distress just sitting in this trial, right? So I don't think, the, I don't think we can bring it. We, the, the lawyers are certainly not culpable for Amber's PTSD. And the third piece of the testimony that really bothered me was Dr. Hughes' suggestion that Amber must not have borderline personality disorder or histrionic personality disorder because none of her therapists had diagnosed her with that. Look, you have to understand the job of the therapist. The therapist is not there to keep a really clear record of all the symptoms they see. The therapist's job is to improve the well-being of their clients. And so they will act in alignment with that goal at all times unless there's some kind of external force. So for example, if you take insurance as a therapist, you may have to show that your client has some kind of diagnosable disorder so that, that you can get paid to treat them. That's an external force. Other times, you as a therapist will give a diagnosis because it serves the client in some way. So for example, clients that are depressed might want to know that what they're feeling is, is tangible, it exists, that there is a disorder tied to it, this is what it is. That feels supportive at times. Other times, and oftentimes with personality disorders, telling someone that you are histrionic feels awful. Telling someone that you are a narcissistic, narcissist can feel awful. And if the therapist doesn't believe that it would be beneficial for the client, they won't do it. Which is, there was one of the therapists that was mentioned in the case that when questioned under cross-examination, Dr. Hughes had to acknowledge that therapist gives no diagnoses. So, so looking at the notes and going, oh, there's no diagnosis of borderline is a sort of a silly argument that maybe flies if you're talking to people that don't know anything about therapy. But, but Dr. Hughes knows better. And finally, it drives me nuts that she would go on the stand and try and argue that this is not mutual intimate partner violence. It, it, I, I think in her mind, she's thinking Johnny Depp is bigger and stronger and more powerful, so therefore he can't possibly be abused which is a ludicrous position to hold. It's not common, it's not as common as violence going the other direction, but it absolutely happens. Oh, oh and by the way, we have audio of her hitting him. She acknowledges that she hit him. His finger was cut off. I mean, it seems like, it seems silly for her to take a stance that is so objectively false. Without question, both of them treated each other it is absolutely mutual intimate partner violence, unquestionably. Those are my global thoughts. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I will link the video I did about Dr. Curry, who was Johnny Depp's psychologist, here. Thank you so much for listening.